So the recording has started, and we have nine seconds left on the timer. And uh, we'll start promptly at 2 o'clock, which it is now. And there's the timer. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our fourth webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series, Reading Strategies for the Digital Age. And this is a very, <laughs> this is a very special IGNIS presentation because this is one of our faculty learning communities. Um, so we're very, very excited to have our dedicated and diligent educators presenting on the work that they've been doing over the last year around this, or the fruits of their labor. Ignis is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today and with this larger series, is to ignite your curiosity and expose you to opportunities for new understanding. This series is brought to you by the SBCTC eLearning and Assessment Teaching and Learning Offices, and your hosts today are me, Jennifer Wessom. I'm the Program Administrator for Faculty Development. And also joining us today and filling in for Alyssa Sells, my e-learning counterpart, my e-learning twin, uh, Monique Belair, who is also from our SBCTC e-learning office. We're excited to offer this webinar series to you. And we have a great lineup of presenters today. Um, so, um, and first off, before we start, I would like to thank our presenters, and we'll be introducing them shortly. So we're going to get started by running through a few Collaborate tools and doing a few quick group recordings, or a few quick group activities, I'm sorry. And I will say just quickly that this session will be recorded, and you can access the recording links on the ATL blog. Um, our recordings and resources site and the full schedule, and I'll be posting those links at the end of the session so you can access them again. All right, let me call up the slide deck here. So as you can see, here's a mini layout of the screen that you're looking at. And as you can see, there's a toolbar. You can see a window where all of our lovely participants are. There's a chat window, and you can type things in. And I encourage you right now to ever have everyone just type something in, like a hello, or a hi, or a um, glad to be here. Uh, just something to experiment with using that chat window. You'll also see that here is a breakdown of the participant window. And I'd encourage you also now to check out how to use the emoticons. Um, you know, just there, some of them are pretty fun. You know, I love, I personally love the applause button. Um, but also, if you're wanting people to go slower or faster, there's lots of, oh, Monique's confused. Monique, I hope you're joking. <laughs> OK, phew, OK. Um, there's also a step away icon. Um, and so that, you know, then just people know that you're gone. And if you want to talk during the, um, especially during the Q&A uh, portion, you can just press that button, and it will cue um, the order in which you raised your hand, which I think is really helpful. Um, so that's that. Uh, chat window demystified, you know, type here, <laughs> and the whiteboard tools. And we're actually going to use these right now. So if you hover your mouse over the tool, um, if you could click your mouse, uh, hover your mouse, mouse over the sun icon, and click on it, and that will give you a pointer. And now we're going to use it for a fun activity. So here is a map, and as you can see, we've got BC in here, we've got Idaho in here, because we have been attracting people from our, our friends from other states. So if you could put where you are, Excellent, excellent. So it looks like the majority of us, the majority of us are in Washington today, but we have Molly logging in from Idaho, and we have someone joining us from uh, Canada. So this is just really, it's just really great. 
And now we're going to do a quick poll with our polling function. And you'll see in which format do you prefer to read. And so you'll see your little polling button. And if you could vote on what you, how do you like to read? And I'll just give you a few more minutes to find that little icon and vote. And now I'm going to publish the results. Usually Alyssa does this, so I'm a little nervous. Here we go. I'm publishing the responses. Awesome. So you can see that 33% um, uh, of you responded A, 8% of you responded B, 41% of you responded C, and it looks like two people responded to the none. Um, so great. So it's kind of fun to look and see what the functionalities are. Um, and then here's another one. Uh, what do you read most online? And I'm just going to change the polling type so it A through E. So go ahead and let's try it again. What do you what do you read most online? And I'm going to vote on this one because I forgot last time. And I'll publish the results. Interesting. So most of us are getting our news sources online. Um, I am the sole one person reads scholarly articles. Um, I'm the sole person who reads novels. So very, very, and some of us read, one of us reads nothing online. That's good. That's very interesting. Or it looks like none. It looks like I think none is actually when when there was somebody who didn't vote. All right. So with that, um, I am now going to introduce our presenters. And I'm looking for that slide with everyone's names. And it looks like that maybe got a little bit out of order. So I'm sorry. I apologize for that. So we have Don Holly. She's, um, and, and Dawn, I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Holly. She's a librarian um, and in e, an e-learning staff at Bellingham Technical College. Judy Wise, faculty. Uh, Tracy Taylor, a librarian. And Su Stu Sepp, who's our, the, who is the director of e-learning at Bellingham Tech. I almost said our, <laughs> our director. Yes, and yay librarians. I know I agree, right? Um, and also, I, I'm just I'm just scrolling down. I love um, reading the the chat window, um, although it's hard to read it when you're moderating. <laughs> so it's it's fun seeing people post comments in the chat. So with that, I am going to let our presenters take it away. Uh, reading strategies for the digital age. All right. So um, this is Dawn, and I'm up first. And um, I just wanted to let you know that we are excited to be sharing our group's work on digital reading with you. And before we dive into some of our findings, we'd like to provide a little more background information about us and our project. So our community of faculty, librarians, and e-learning staff formed as a result of a few different student support initiatives at Bellingham Technical College, including our campus-wide participation in Achieving the Dream, one of our most successful Achieving the Dream interventions, the Reading Apprenticeship Initiative, our library's digital literacy and professionalism project sponsored by the Washington State Library, and our e-learning department's development of digital support content and tools. So. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we received a faculty learning community grant, which will continue through the end of this academic year, from the Washington State Board for Community and Technical, Technical Colleges to explore our shared interest in student success and support in the areas of digital reading and comprehension. We are exploring current research on our topic, and we're working to identify online reading strategies, tools, and best practices so that we can all better support our students. Our project research questions examine how reading digital text differs from reading hard copy text, the differences in reading hard copy, static digital text, and hypertext, 
specific strategies and best practices for reading online, and how we can change and improve our courses, workshops, and trainings to help students be more successful online readers. To answer these questions, we have been very busy. We have administered student surveys and held student focus group discussions. We've done a lot of reading, and in particular have found the book Words on Screen by Naomi Barron um, to be particularly relevant and useful. And we've also gathered and read as much of the current research on our topic as possible. We are compiling an annotated bibliography to document and support our project, and you'll have access to some of those materials. Um, to, uh, let's see, I lost track of where I was, sorry. <laughs> Students that we surveyed for the most part um, preferred reading printed text over digital text, and this is a preference that is consistent with what we found expressed in existing research. It's also what our students expressed in our focus group findings, and um, this is a word um, cloud that captures some of the transcript conversations that we had with our students in their focus groups. So our topic is quite broad, but we have distilled several themes from it, and we have found that the reading environment for digital text is very different from printed text. We have found that academic or deep reading online presents very unique challenges. We've learned that comprehension for online reading requires brand new strategies. And we've learned that distractions online are a significant barrier for a lot of people when they read online. Students have told us that identifying high quality, credible information to read online can be challenging. And we've learned that many readers continue to value and rely upon the physicality of printed text. We've also found that not everyone is aware of how to best take notes and annotate online, which are key skills in academic reading and study. And we know that for many people, access to digital devices and to the internet remains an ongoing and significant issue. So we've been looking at all of these themes from the perspectives of our different roles on campus. And to discuss our findings and applications from a faculty point of view, I'd like to pass the microphone to Judy Wise, who is one of our wonderful faculty who teaches basic academic skills and ESL courses here at BTC. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Don. I'll slide, go to the next slide. Um, okay, so we want to start this uh, section of some perspectives from the instruction side with a question. How do you teach reading for your discipline? And so if you would like to type an answer in the chat window, and Jennifer, if you want to help me, you're so good at navigating and moderating. <laughs> I would be happy to help. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's see what we say. It's a recursive process. I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> um, but we'll wait and see what other people say. I can see people are typing. OK. So Molly says, I'm a medical librarian, so I teach my students my students to start with basic info and then move up to the more complex. OK, so Molly, would you say like a scaffolding approach? Um, you provide some background that, OK, good. Nice paraphrase. Walter says, mostly through analytical reading and annotation. OK. So taking it apart, making notes. What discipline, Walter? English. Mm -hmm. English. So it looks like Karen, so Walter also teaches through class discussions, and he's English faculty. And then Karen uh, says, in tutoring, I support with the regular instructor starts and then add problem-solving strategies. Oh, good. Yeah. OK. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jane says, demonstrate and talk through how I read, especially scholarly articles. OK. Good. Right. You showing, uh, modeling your expertise. Yeah. Walter says, I do what Jane said, too. I know that triggered me, too. I was like, me, too. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Walter says, just did it today. 
Okay, good. And it looks active, active reading. reading. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have some reading. We have some reading experts here in this room. It sounds like that's great. Um, I'm gonna should I go ahead? I'll just go, go ahead, ahead and feel free to ask a question. Oh, please. Uh, Okay, so yeah, we find that um, having some kind of an overall approach to reading uh, on screen is uh, the same. Uh, as with print text, we need to build curriculum around reading apprenticeship dimensions. There's something like the reading apprenticeship dimensions, which I'm prepared to show you in just a minute. The personal, social, cognitive, knowledge building um, kind of aspects uh, of reading and use it in metacognition. Let me see if I can find how to put this up. My screen, I want to show you. You're doing you. great. Um, I, I turn <laughs> off my mic uh, so you can't hear me breathing. <laughs> but then I okay. start. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble finding where it is. Maybe it's over here. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> OK. Um, Maybe Judy forgot to do that. OK, so I forgot to find that, so I won't share that. I'm going to cancel that, and we'll come back. How do I come back? Um, uh, perfect. And Judy, if you, if you, if you want to post okay. a link into the chat, I could, I could take us there, too, if, that, if you want. Cool. The link's on the bottom yeah. here. There we go. I could probably copy that. You want to copy that? OK, we could just type it in here. If you want to keep talking, I can do it for you. That's fine, fine. So. Um, Make it personal. Um, w when you're working with students, we find it's helpful to see, to help students see themselves as readers of digital text. A lot of them, we find, prefer the print. So help them to explore their preferences. So one thing, one example is uh, doing a personal reading history reflection. There are different things you can do. Making it social, uh, that's the uh, social dimension. Uh, find ways students can explore their benefits and limitations of on-screen reading through group discussions. Um, make sure you have activities that encourage a dialogue uh, about the online environments. Uh, surface strategies have students observe and record each other uh, while reading difficult on-screen text. Discuss what was done and why. And um, then we, oh, thank you for pulling that up. And then if you could scroll down. Um, make it known. So this is our cognitive dimension. They call it the cognitive dimension in the reading apprenticeship framework. And that's, you know, teach explicit vocabulary, um, how to use on-screen devices, um, you know, bringing those uh, expert knowledge and discourse practices into the classroom. OK. So, should we go to the next one? Absolutely. Um, and I don't have a switch. Yeah, no worries. I will. So I'll stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> like the title of my memoir, right? There we Time go. to stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Um, and so before working with students and having them, giving them a reading assignment, we find it's helpful to help students find their purpose for reading. A lot of students aren't mindful of their purpose. And so they'll just go in there and um, just start using like internet or just going through a database of articles. Um, so if the students know their purpose, they can adjust their behavior and their reading time. And what we're going to talk, I'm going to explain later, is something called mapping out uh, their reading plan. And there's a purpose for that. So just I'll get into that a little bit. But uh, do they need to search for information? Then they should, you know, then they'll want to just scan. Uh, do they need to remember the information? Then they'll need to study, read, and deep read. And they might even want to print out the article if they need to remember the information. A lot of people like to print out the article and, and highlight notes. Do they just need to get a general idea so they can decide if this is information? Then that would just be a skimming activity. Um, also, before um, a major reading task, we want students to, um, we want to help them cut out their clutter, uh, remove distractions for digitally formatted text. That would be screen text. That might be static. Or hypertext, like on the internet. Um, that external distractors might be something online. It might be in the room. Um, they might want to adjust size and color online maybe some ad blockers, turning off their cell phones, maybe being mindful, um, using these mindful practices. 
uh, that they need to remove distractions. Getting organized, um, there are some applications for note-taking devices or opening up a, um, a Microsoft Word document or using Digo or um, some other annotation devices I think we're going to talk about later, some of the other people. Um, teach specific approaches to reading on the internet. This, this is an interesting site that I came up with, I found at Colorado State. I'm going to share this page. And they have a complete explanation of the differences between the kinds of reading. I think people don't realize that, uh, and students don't always realize that they're different. Let me see if I can share that. And I'm going to share, and I have that with my page. What happened? Now, sh oops, not that one. Now sharing. Okay, can you guys see this? We can. Okay, so this is that link, reading through the World Wide Web, and as you can see on the right-hand side from the menu, um, how web documents differ, um, it goes into uh, how web documents are associative and more fluid, not linear texts, um, has some suggestions, some strategies. Uh, and so that, that's a good resource for, you know, pulling out some things to look at um, how, the, how those texts differ. Now I have to get back here. How do I do this? Excuse me, guys. You know, my You're back. doing great. Okay, thanks. Um, what else did I want to say? So some, another thing is in databases, when they're doing research articles, we've found that uh, some of the like ProQuest article databases um, don't have any textual features, and so you can teach students to chunk those out into meaningful chunks, or to use a PDF version that has textual features. Um, let's see. We can talk to students about the value of evaluating the hyperlink. We're going to look at that in a minute. Um, asking questions, students. Questions about different domains, edus, .orgs, gov, .gov, and comms, and having them think about the um, validity of those. And just uh, we'll be looking at a way to map, like we said, we want to map um, a linear path which for a, a world of information online that's not linear uh, often. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Oh. I think this is in the wrong place, but um, let me go on to the next one. That may be my fault. Um, OK, that's fine. So a, this is from some work out of the Journal of Academic and Adult Literacy, Cho and Affler back, uh, to help them develop for strategic, they call this strategic internet strategies. and. Basically, they, the strategic readers they found through this Think Aloud protocol analysis was that they explore and select web sources. They interconnect them. Instead of in a text, which is confined, a print text, um, you have to interconnect these different texts and, and find meaning and relevancy between all these different texts. And um, strategic readers can do that. They need to evaluate, as I mentioned earlier, and critique web sources. Um, and it's, it's more complex with internet text. It's a more complex task to evaluate. It's not, it's often hidden from, and the authorities are more diverse than in a print text. Um, and then they need to monitor and adjust uh, their internet reading to accomplish their goal. Sorry about that. I'm getting a little bit lost. I want to make sure I covered everything. Absolutely no worries. It's, it's a little okay. disorienting sometimes, especially if your slides aren't in the order you expected. So it, it is. It is. And I wanted to provide, I think I'm missing something. So I'm going to show you, share with you a way to help map students out. And that is with one of these checklists. Um, some of the one thing you can do is to help students um, Okay. Can you Not see this yet? Um, okay. It looks like 
I don't know. Can other people? Can Posting other people see things? Yeah, not yet. Um, yeah, we can just see the edge. I'm just wondering, do you have two screens, Judy? I will see. I'm. I might have two screens. So what do I? Let's see if I can get down here. And wow. Okay. Oh, um, don't sorry. be sorry. We're nice. fine. We're just fine. Um, if you'd like, you could. Is it? Is it a website that you want to show us? It's not. It's a PDF. If I can upload a PDF and show this checklist, a checklist that is a suggestion for helping students map in the associative and fluid environment of online reading, you can map it out. And this is like a, but it's a PDF. So try clearing your there. whole, not you know, not shutting things down, but try putting minimizing everything but that PDF. You know, um, if you choose the. Um, application sharing option, it should give you the option of like just sharing one thing rather than your oh. entire desktop. Did I miss that? You could do that. That's okay. a great suggestion. And I'm not sure where that is. So is Okay, so um okay, right, yeah. Are you, it looks like you might be doing it now. It, it'll give you an option of what to share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was it was install mode. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah. Well, I apologize. <laughs> okay, you know, Judy. The other thing you could do is just shoot it to me real quick, if you if you can, and okay. I can just do it. I could share it. I think that's a good idea, Jen. Let's do. And what we're doing is we're modeling <laughs> living in the <laughs> age of technology and thinking on our feet. <laughs> thinking on our feet. I have just one second. You know, there's also, and I think um, you could push out the file to the whole group. Oh. And that's under, um, I want to say, um, I believe it's also through application sharing and then let me see. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Hmm, yeah, try not. doing it. I know. I'm. Try, I know that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, exactly. Think it on our feet. So that's not it. Darn it. It's easy too, and I can't remember where. It, I wonder if it's file open. Oh, yeah. If you go uh, file tab at the top left corner, and in that drop down menu, it'll say file and then open, and then you can choose file for transfer. Actually, yeah, it says file open, mm -hmm. and then file for transfer. I'll type it in the chat window. Right, and then that should give you your um, your document. Okay, and, your and Jennifer, I just forwarded it. I was having a little <laughs> difficulty, um, so I, I have it. I just sent it to you on your email, Perfect. Um, and I'll come back to this. Perfect. Perfect. Up the slide here. Okay. See so you. I, I was very impressed with um, yes the article reading on the internet realizing and constructing potential tasks by Cho and Afflerback. Um, like I said, they use a think aloud protocol for uh, with multiple students and they analyzed them and then they reported this. But um, they came up with basically the same things we know in reading apprenticeship and some of these best practices in reading uh, and what research says and, and that's breaking it down, scaffolding it. Okay, yeah, you've got it there, thanks, and we can make it bigger. So this is a suggested way to scaffold um, reading and make all these things visible. Oh, how do you make it bigger? Can you make it bigger? I think so. Absolutely. I'm, in fact, I know so. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so this, on the left-hand side, uh, they go through questions such as, you know, having the students explore and select websites. So this is the what you do. Um, you interconnect and learn from multiple sources and then evaluate and critique uh, those sources. 
And then scroll down to the last one there. The last one is monitor and adjust internet reading. And then there's questions that help students perform those tasks. And then it explains the why. So you can activate your prior knowledge, plan your information research, um, and so forth like that. So I thought this was uh, a pretty good tool here. Um, so basically what we find is that this checklist can um, develop productive um, and strategic readers of internet and hypertext. So and it helps them do all the things that are important in um, developing these routines and practices. I'm going to go next to um, another uh, piece of research we found. Um, something called the Internet Reciprocal Teaching, and it's basically RA for the Internet. Uh, and they talk about using a scaffolded um, approach as well. And this, I think, comes out of um, University of Connecticut. And it starts with teacher-led modeling. So some of you mentioned that you do uh, modeling and um, they, of the strategies for online learning using a think aloud process of active reading, so showing them how to actively read, uh, and again, using a checklist. So this is, some of this is the same, but just in different names. Um, collaborative modeling. The collaborative modeling would be where students take, um, they work on larger projects, and they discuss what's going on. They reflect. Um, they notice what they might have. They surface strategies at this stage, uh, maybe trying out, you know, and it could be just an introduction to reading online that you're teaching when you do this. Have them talk about it and see what they came up with. Um, and then finally, an inquiry stage, which is um, they bring their own interest to now to the research project, to the online research, and, um, and use and, and incorporate what they've learned from the first two stages. So finally, um, I have a list here of what I just basically call engaging in and encouraging mindful practices. And some of this is, um, most of this is from the text um, from Naomi Barron, Words on Screen, and kind of her thoughts of what she came up with. And, and we all agreed that this is basically things that we knew, um, but we're out there in, in different words. So we have uh, form follows function. And that means basically encouraging students to use the form, that whatever form of reading or text that works for them and their purpose. Again, coming back to that purpose. Uh, another uh, aha was um, scheduling in the quiet and sustained. So finding moments in the class or in students' lives to uh, have opportunities to read without distraction is important. Um, out of sight, out of mind. Let's see. Model how not to multitask when in front of students. So this was a suggestion Baron came up with, is uh, how to keep your cell phone out so you're not multitasking, encouraging you know, non-multitasking projects. Because students now are, are kind of dividing their attention. And so it's focus is very important. Um, she has says, honor thy printed text and author. In other words, display respect for print and authorship. Um, respect, yeah, for print and authorship. Um, appreciating the authors of who did this. And offer activities to honor deep reading to counterbalance the trend of short reading online. So in her book, she talks about um, that we move to just reading surfacely. And I think we all, as instructors, um, understand that, how our students are, are very much surface readers and don't spend time deep reading. Um, at what cost, uh, she says, what, how, is, is the print, is, excuse me, the digital text more important? Um, have students ask questions about the environmental impact of digital versus print, you know, when they're cho trying to choose different textbooks. Um, and don't abandon learning outcomes for the sake of cost. So this was in a bigger concept of trying to determine do you want to require only digital text or, or, or use um, print text. So those are just some, these are just some kind of summarized things that we've come up with. And now I'd like to 
turn it over to Tracy um, with some, uh, some ideas from the library. Everyone, how's everyone doing today? Um, I'm going to talk about, can everybody hear me? Okay. I'm going to talk today about um, how the library has um, addressed some of these um, barriers that students are experiencing with online reading um, through our current um, research that we've been doing um, as a group through um, the FLC and the library, we've found that um, the use of digital course material is increasing, but the comprehension um, of students reading online text is um, lower than printed text. So in the learning community, it was revealed that through the focus groups and surveys that our students preferred printed text to digital text. And students in the focus group described several bar barriers that were mentioned earlier in um, their success to online reading. A few of these were the distrust in the quality of resources. Um, they felt that print was more trustworthy. Um, the, they felt overwhelmed and distracted by all of the information that was online with um, all the hyperlinks, the advertisements that pulled them away from um, the reading that they were needing to do. They um, all expressed a lack of online reading skills, um, didn't know about some of the note-taking strategies um, or skills that could help them improve their reading and um, comprehension and understanding um, when reading online text. They also experienced the physiological and environmental effects. Uh, a few students complained of um, the eye strain, reading online, the glare, um, and neck strain. Um, the environment they were in was too noisy. There was not enough light. Um, so those are a few of the um, distractions and barriers that um, we found that we will look at. So a, a couple of our research questions were, what can we as librarians do to improve student online reading skills and comprehension? And the second one was, how do we connect with what we have learned with um, what we already do. So what we already do, let me go to the, I don't know if this is on the next slide. Um, nope. So what we already do is we already teach um, students, um, we address some of the barriers by teaching students. We teach them information literacy. We teach them digital literacy. Um, how to evaluate websites to determine credibility of the sources that they're finding. Um, we teach them searching skills, and um, so we're already addressing some of those barriers. So we also provide them computers, um, good working computers and internet access, uh, technology support, and we offer digital devices um, that they can use uh, to help them with their online um, reading. Um, let's see. So next, um, I have a question for everybody, um, and you, you can answer um, in the chat window. How do you think academic libraries can help students navigate the challenges of reading online? Tracy, do you want me to help you navigate the chat window, or do you feel comfortable? Please, go ahead and do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> my, my pleasure. So it looks like people are starting to type. And I'll just repeat the question while people are typing. Um, how do you think academic libraries can help students navigate the challenges of reading online? I'm going to type my own answer. So I typed in maybe co-leading workshops with faculty. But Molly Montgomery says, teach them strategies like active reading, chunking, online annotation tools, et cetera. Um, Walter says, a lot of it is just helping students identify what it is that they are looking at. 
uh, the difference between a website and an online article, for example. Uh, Judy comments, good point, Walter. I know I had the same, I had the same thought. And I really, I like Molly's suggestion about teaching strategies. You know, it seems like a really good place for libraries, for librarians to model. Uh, Karen says, I agree with Walter. Library professionals are a great way for students to understand and evaluate online sources. Judy says that's what they need, helping them become mindful. Excellent. Um, okay. Molly said, I would like to work more closely with faculty. Librarians plus faculty equals awesome. Yes. Molly, I concur. <laughs> Don says, yay. I know, I just have this instinctive gut level response to librarians. Like sometimes if I meet someone and I like love the way they think and see the world and then I find out they're a librarian, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, because you're a librarian. <laughs> That's why. Great responses, everybody. Thank you. Karen says, I frequently tell students how much I rely on library staff to assist me in real world tasks. I know, right? Amen. <laughs> we, we can't get along without you. <laughs> OK, so just to move along so we give Stu some time to talk about oh, e-learning. Right. Um, looking at um, all of the things that we currently do, how do we make connections between what we're doing and what we've learned through the research that we have done so far? We can do this by incorporating what we've learned about online reading into our teaching and library practices. So in regards to teaching, um, we also have resources and access tutorials and tools. So with teaching, we can collaborate with faculty to design targeted instruction that addresses student barriers to reading online. And we are going to be collaborating with another one of our faculty learning community members, Karen, um, in one of her reading classes. Um, she's having the librarians come in and um, help the students with um, the databases and reading online. And we um, can do offer more searching and digital resource evaluation instruction. We can um, be more focused on um, what we're learning about, um, what digital resources there are. Um, we can increase that um, and be more focused. We can introduce the note-taking and annotation strategies for reading digital material. I know that there are some databases that have a lot of tools that are um, available and we can show students how to use those tools. We can um, help students um, learn to be mindful when they're setting up their physical and digital environments to help um, decrease the distractions that keeps them more focused. They can um, be more self-confident in their online reading. Um, the library, as mentioned previously, is an excellent um, place for students to um, have that peace and quiet and to be able to focus and, and do their, their reading. So the next one is um, the library can provide resources and access. Um, we can, uh, we currently have a lot of equipment that we check out. We have um, iPads, um, we have different, other different mobile devices and laptops, and we can continue to do, um, keep up with technology and providing more equipment as it becomes available to students. Um, when looking at collection development, um, we can look at different, um, the different interfaces and how easy it is for students to use the materials and looking at the subject and content to make sure that it is appropriate. Um, we can provide mobile hotspots as well as print and digital copies of text. So students that have difficulties reading digital um, have the print option and sometimes um, there are no print texts of um, digital copies. So it's still a challenge. A lot of our students still don't have internet access. So providing those mobile hotspots will help students be more successful. 
Um, collaborating with our campus bookstore to provide print and digital textbook options so um, to ensure the accessibility of the open educational resources. This may be challenging for some people um, at different uh, colleges um, getting buy-in from the bookstore, but it is still a goal. The library can provide tutorials and tools um, for helping um, with giving students the digital reading strategies. There's always um, something new coming out, um, made available, and we can just keep up on that, um, the new innovations. The tutorials that we can create, um, there are many, if, if it's just even how to use a certain tool, an iPad, how to navigate a new um, app that helps students um, read the text, like removing distractions from the digital text. There are certain software and applications. Um, so the library has um, a lot that they can teach students um, on how to become more competent, and um, we can help them with the different tools that we have. and. Um, and so forth. So now I'm going to pass this on to Stu, and he's going to probably talk to you more, a lot more about the apps as well. Sure, thanks, Tracy. Um, so I'm Stu. I'm the director of e-learning at BTC, and I'm just going to um, wrap us all up here because we're running out of time. Um, so I've got a question for everybody. Um, what do you do, if anything, to make reading online easier for yourself? So go ahead and write all that in the chat room, or in the chat on the bottom left. And I know we've already talked about reducing distractions, so Molly says print it off. Well, a lot of students we find do that, actually, so that's a thing. Change fonts. Don, what kind of fonts do you change it to? Comic Sans, Papyrus, all our favorite. A bigger font, OK. OK, so Molly says, in a PDF, we use highlighted and annotation tools to, I guess, bring focus into um, the text that we want. Jane says, uh, I reverse the text. And uh, oh, man, my browser just slowed down. So. Um, uh, Jane said, I reverse the text and the background <laughs> with a dark background and white letters. Got it. Um, Don says, yeah, Comic Sans is awesome. And we print and try, try to avoid multiple tabs, says Karen, um, Yeah, when you've got a life tabs going on with multiple stuff going on in your browser. It's a bit confusing. Um, Judy says, if I need to remember the content, I just print it off. And then Walter says, print, read at work with a bigger monitor. Oh, cool. I do uh, something a little different. I, pr I um, make sure that I have an iPad around, because for some reason, I'm of the younger persuasion, and a piece of paper is the same as an iPad to me. <laughs> That's interesting. So yeah, yeah, as long as I have something in my hand, right? That's we, we and we talked about that in this group. It's like that physicality of the document makes it, I don't know, more memorable or something like that. I, it's funny. I actually find that my iPhone is my best device for reading. Oh really? Do you have an iPad though? <laughs> I do have an iPad, and I don't like it as much. <laughs> oh, interesting. I, I know guess, it's well, weird. Most of the stuff comes down to personal preference. That's one of the things we found too. It's like if you like paper, go ahead and print it. If you like your iPhone. If you like your Apple Watch, like reading a novel on an Apple Watch will be fun, I think. Mm. Yeah. So um, moving on. Um, so that's one of the things we were talking about, just cleaning things up. Um, and I, I heard this um, phrase at a conference a few weeks ago called just called clean reading. And it's basically a way to minimize distraction when you're reading online. Um, yeah, Jane says, I like the iPad or iPhone instead of the iPad because the eyes don't need to track as far across the screen. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I just hold my iPad super close to my face. <laughs> um, so to make your documents cleaner, um, there's a few things that you can do. There are browser plugins. And I, by all means, like I'm not listing every single thing that's on the market. I'm just highlighting some of the more popular ones here. Um, the first one there that I've noted is called Evernote Clearly. And it's just a plugin or an extension that you can get for Chrome and Firefox that basically strips everything out. It strips out ads. It strips out menus. It strips out all of the um, distracting things on a web page, and uh, it can let you, it, it almost looks like you're reading paper almost. Nice white background, and you can um, change the themes and stuff to make it all sepia tone and everything. 
Um, some browsers actually have that built in, like Safari. There's something called reading lists within Safari. Um, and then, of course, there's just the print mode. Like back in the day before we had these um, tools, you could just go to, you, you know, on some websites how it says, like, share to Facebook, or there's also an option that says just print, like print layout, something like that. Um, so that would minimize distraction as well. I don't think we need to do that anymore, but some websites, uh, that still works. Um, Dawn has used Queerly, it looks like. She says it's good. And Walter says, I'm tired of reading on Kindle, but I didn't like it, even though I was enthusiastic. Yeah, I have a Kindle. I have an iPad. I have an iPhone. I have a, yeah, I have too many things. If you're reading in the sun, an iPad's terrible. <laughs> um, as far as apps go, um, for all of your mobile devices, there's uh, one called Readability, um, there's one called Instapaper, and there's one called Paper, and basically these pretty much all work the same. Um, basically what you do, and it's sort of tied down to the managing section that I have below. Um, when you're on a website, what you can do is you can send an article that you're reading to any of these services. So there's usually like an export to paper, or you can get a browser, I have browser plugins for paper is the one that I use. And so what you can do there is you can just, you're reading a BBC or CNN article and you say, I want to read this later. So you click a button and it basically sends it to your account on any one of these services. And then that way you can go to your iPhone or your iPad or Galaxy or whatever you have and then bring up that app and everything that you saved is in there, nice and clean, readable. It really doesn't even look like a website anymore because they've stripped everything out. So these are really cool tools. Um, next up, um, annotating. We talked about annotating before. Um, and again, this is just a minimal cross-section of what exists. Of course, now Adobe Acrobat has, uh, ooh, Judy, what's Digo? Uh, Acrobat has um, uh, the annotation tools built in into the iPad app now. I think you can annotate on desktop as well. Um, Notability is a really popular one on um, iPad, so you can feel free to use that. Oh, okay, so Deco um, is another one that I didn't mention. I'm mean, like, what I just did when I first started learning about this stuff years ago is you just go to in your Google Play Store or your iOS App Store and you just type in annotation <laughs> and it just comes up with so many different options. So again, it's really personal preference, what you're used to, all that sort of thing. Um, another couple of ones that I wanted to mention and sort of ties into the library side of things as well is annotation apps um, as tied to research. Um, so there's, it has, uh, everybody's probably heard of EndNote. Um, there's another one called Zotero. It's, they're basically um, citation referencing and collecting um, apps that, that collect your uh, academic articles, things you, like that. I use one called Papers on my Mac, which syncs between an iPad app and everything like that. But it's really nice to be able to collect the, and tag all of your academic research papers and then be able to annotate those and then make notes on them. And you, there's so many different ways. You can highlight just like you would on paper. You can put a sticky note just like you would on a, uh, like a um, posty note. Um, and then you can even write just general notes about the paper itself independent of any place in the paper, which is kind of nice. Um, next up, uh, I'll blaze through this a little bit. Um, when we're thinking of learning design, working in e-learning is super fun because I get to work with the instructors like Judy and then I get to work with the um, librarians as well like uh, Dawn and Tracy. And so dealing with all these things, I always hear from students, I hear from instructors, all of the challenges that they face as far as reading goes. So one thing that uh, we can talk about of course, is e-textbooks and learning materials. So um, I've seen a lot of um, e-textbooks, like I'm, I'm doing bunny ears like quotes, but you can't see me. Um, so is it actually an e-textbook? Like when I think of an e-book, um, it's um, on a Kindle or it's on a um, iBooks app or it's on some sort of Kindle app or something like that, that is natively, you're able to annotate it, you're able to highlight things, you're able to do that. But I've seen some of the publishers, they, they sell these e-textbooks and it's just basically like the most complicated website that you've ever seen from the 90s. So that's the thing as you're um, trying to find these materials. Are they true ebooks or are they just websites that are like branded as ebooks? And then the question is, can, are they portable? Can you put them on devices? Can you put them on multiple devices? Can you print them? Can they be annotated? All these things. Um, so those are definitely things to be um, aware of when you're selecting these materials. Um, next up, I use, uh, I work pretty closely with Canvas. So when people are creating content within Canvas, 
Um, I've seen some instructors, they use like super huge fonts. They like put back like yellow and green backgrounds on the screens. And again, it makes it look like the 90s again, which is awesome in some ways. But in other ways, it makes it a little bit difficult to read because some people kind of think, oh, I'm bringing attention to this by making it like neon pink background with like um, bright blue text or something. So my recommendation for that is always just to kind of keep it simple. Don't do the crazy colors thing. Definitely use headings and spacing to your advantage. So if you look at a magazine article or if you look at um, good websites, if you look at even a book, just take a cue from the layout and spacing of that, maybe even like fully justified versus left, right justified, things like that. Um, and then just look at the documents that you're using. Try to make everything as readable and as simple to read as possible. And then also think about what you're uploading to Canvas. If you're uploading documents like PDFs and things like that, can that be annotated as well? Can that be put on a device? I know we've got Office on our iOS devices and our uh, Google devices now, but there's still some files that might not be readable on uh, mobile devices. So that's something to think about too. And Judy says, uh, reading has become simplified with digital text. Yeah, and complicated, I would argue, as well. <laughs> um, so that's all I had for e-learning. Um, the biggest thing that, um, so this is basically a summary of, of our ideas, kind of hearkening back to the beginning of our presentation here. Um, the biggest thing that I took away from this project is in the text here. It's basically like the thing being read and the purpose for which you're reading it will dictate the strategies that you use as a student and, I mean, even for us as well. So if you're reading an academic article, a novel, a blog, you're going to use totally different strategies for um, how you read that thing. And then why are you reading it? Are you quickly skimming it? Are you wanting to read it later when you're on a boat somewhere? Um, are you wanting to print it off? And like, why are you actually reading this thing? Um, so those kind of two sides of the thing. Um, will really help dictate the strategy. And then again, here are the points that we uh, discussed earlier in our presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer says it's kind of a paradox. That's that's true, because sometimes, yeah, some, I, I'm finding sometimes when I'm um, moving my documents around, oh, I want to read this later, I want to read this now, it's like it's not really right. It doesn't feel right to put it in that place, but I have to because it's digital and, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Um, as far as our presentation slides and everything, we've got a website up. Um, feel free to copy that down or I'll put it in the um, chat session here. And on here you'll see our slides and um, a couple of our resources that we alluded to in the presentation. Um, and we've got a big, nice, long reference list. So as far as all of our uh, academic articles and books and stuff that we found, um, feel free to take a look at all of our references. And uh, oh, we also have our survey re results up there too, which is super interesting. Um, so there's the link. I put it in the chat window. You can have a look there. And uh, I think that's all we had. So oh wait, oh, oh somebody scooped me ahead. There we go. So thanks everyone. And thank you, Judy, Tracy, Don, Stu, and uh, Karen and Jane couldn't join us today. That would have been a lot of presenters, but I just want to say um, we only have like one one minute left, so I guess I'll just say that these this work is exactly why I think our faculty learning communities are the best thing that my office does. I love the idea of faculty asking inquiry questions and not just fa educators, you know, librarians, faculty members, e-learning directors, and designing a curriculum for yourself that will enhance teaching and learning and also, it, you know, enrich your own understandings of things. Um, and there's so much great and so many wonderful things happening on the chat window right now. But I'll just say very quickly that, um, Oh wait, oh it looks like it didn't get uploaded. Okay, anyway, um, 
that this web, this webinar recording will be um, uploaded to our ATL blog. It will be sent out through all of our various listservs. Um, I'm so happy that we recorded it. <laughs> One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is that it's artifacts that shift a culture. And it seems like you guys showed us some really great artifacts today, some learning artifacts that could be used in our classrooms. Um, and also that other people who were attending had really cool artifacts. So it's, it's just an exciting time to be an educator. And thank you again, Don, Judy, Tracy, and Stu for taking the time this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And I hope everybody has a great afternoon.